Christ is risen. It is night time, so I hope you are able to see me and hear me. It's also raining outside. We've got um, a storm coming tomorrow, and that's the reason why I'm recording at night. I should have recorded today during the day, but I've had a absolutely crippling migraine. So I haven't been able to record during the day as I would have liked to. And tomorrow we have this storm coming with gusts of up to 60 miles per hour. So it would be impossible to record anything. So it is now, I think, close to about two in the morning and um, I'm trying to record something for you. By the grace of God, I'm used to being up at night and I enjoy being up at night. So in a way, this is just me sharing my night with you after a very difficult day. This video, being a Friday video, is in response to some of the comments we received on the video we posted on Tuesday. And there have been quite a number of good comments. Thank you very much for all of them. The ones I'd like to address today are the ones that sought a bit more advice on the idea of um, us becoming something like a good recycling machine that um, takes all the darkness that the world throws at us or all the darkness that we throw at ourselves through our um, disobedience and our um, constant falling into sin. And uh, being able to turn this darkness into light, into something that will eventually serve for our salvation and for the salvation of the world itself. I want to start with something my grandmother used to say, because I have a feeling that the things that our parents and our grandparents say when we are young get imprinted on our brains somewhere, even, even if we don't quite understand what they mean. But they do get imprinted and they do end up defining who we are later in life. In Romanian it sounds Dumnezeu e capamuntul, which translated is close to God is like earth or God is like soil, like dust. I'm convinced she had no idea of how theologically relevant this was. The witness that God becomes like soil, becomes like dust, that God is actually incarnate into earth, into dust, so that he becomes like us, in order for, for us to be able to become like him. God becomes dust so that dust can become God-like. I'm convinced none of this was um, part of her spirituality, but uh, I'm also convinced that she was um, much more holy saint than I shall ever be. But beyond the theological meaning of that saying, there is also a practical aspect to it. And this is what she had in mind. She used to say this, God is like earth. Whenever something bad happened to her or to one of us, <clears throat> we would go to her and complain that this or that happened or someone did something to us or we feel a certain way. And she would just sigh and tell us to bear it and have patience through it all. And eventually she would say, God is like dust. The meaning being that God takes everything that we throw at him and turns it into something positive, into something beautiful. And being a simple peasant woman, earth, dust, was something she dealt with on a daily basis. She knew that if she throws dung from the animals onto earth, earth is going to find a way in which that dung, something that smells horrid initially and seems completely useless, Earth has a way in which it can turn even that dung into something nourishing, so something useful, and eventually something that feeds flowers or vegetables, something that is very useful and beautiful. And by saying that God is like Earth, she meant that God, just like Earth, can take anything we throw at Him, any sin that we commit, any fall that we cannot prevent and turn it into something positive if only we want him to do it, if only we keep ourselves open to his love and his desire to help us. 
And just like God, we are meant to have the same behavior. So in other words, if someone does something bad or someone says something bad that hurts me, that affects me in some way, like earth, like God, I'm supposed to find a way through patience and through love, through forgiveness and understanding, I'm supposed to find a way in which to turn that negative thing into something positive. Now, I may not be able to take away the harm that whatever that person has said or done to me has already created in me. I may not be able to turn that around, but by forcing myself in a good way to forgive and to move forward, to understand and therefore to have compassionate and to love, I am in fact taking the negative, the dung that that person has thrown at me and uh, I'm turning it into something positive because the more forgiving one is, the more loving one is, the more able we are to move forward, the closer we get to Christ and the more Christ-like we become. So what happens ultimately is that that person or that situation, that temptation was thrown at us, mud or dung was thrown at us, but we have managed through patience and through mimicking Christ, striving to act in a way that Christ would have acted. We have managed to turn that into a spiritual plus, into a spiritual virtue. And although we cannot always correct the effects that these bad things, negative things have had, we do manage, by the grace of God, to turn that negative thing into a spiritual positive. And at the end of the day, what matters most? That we look impeccable and we have an impeccable reputation in the world. Or that we slowly, slowly, step by step, temptation by temptation, become more Christ-like and closer to Him so that we find our salvation. The Desert Fathers were so aware that temptations can become the very fuel for our growth, our spiritual growth, that they would be afraid when temptations were lifted from them. There are examples of the Desert Fathers who prayed, asked God to return a temptation, there are examples of the Desert Fathers who, when they were younger, used to pray to God that He would lift up a temptation from them. But as they grew wiser, as they grew more in their spiritual discernment, they realized that temptations are actually useful, that they can grow quicker when tempted. So they changed their prayer from, please deliver me from this temptation, to please help me deal with this temptation, please help me survive this temptation and help me turn it into something good. At the end of the day, all we can do is keep our heads down, keep our hearts up and keep on moving forward. Every time we fall, or every time we are being pushed into falling, every time we are covered by mud or by dung because of our own weakness or because of the um, lack of love of the world, keep your head down, keep your heart up and move forward. Keep your head down in humility before God, in awareness of our own weakness. Keep your heart up, because as long as our hearts are on high with Christ and the saints, nothing can touch us through their intercessions, through His grace, and move forward, even if it feels like you are moving through the depth of hell, even if it feels like you make no step forward really, just put one step in front of the other, 
Keep on moving. Heads down, hearts up, and keep on moving. And sooner or later, grace will descend upon you and light will come. The Church, in its 2,000 years of experience, has learned that temptation is absolutely necessary for our growth. And um, in a certain way, the Church creates laboratory-like, lab-like situations where um, temptation is managed for us. There are um, moments of temptation in which we are thrown intentionally so that we can learn how to manage temptation in these lab-like situations. The point being that when temptation hits us without any sort of control from us, then we have already developed the skills to survive it. For example, we have Lent and all the other fasting periods during the year. There is also the practice of vigil, night vigil, which is something Christ speaks to us about. Christ encourages us to do. The saints have been doing for 2,000 years. The Church is still teaching us how to do them, and yet we rarely use them. There is also the practice of obedience, either in the sense of obeying to one's monastic superior, or obeying to your spouse or for everyone, married or monastic or still single, there is the practice of praying by a rule, a rule of prayer which was set up for you by someone else. And that is regardless of whether or not you like it, whether or not you find it useful, whether or not you understand why you have to do it, you just do it. And the purpose of that rule of prayer is that you are put under obedience to the Church. And that obedience, and that night vigil, and that fasting will teach you in time to manage your temptations, to manage the passions that you discover you have in yourselves, raging in yourselves, so that when these passions hit you, you are able to survive them. Just try fasting for a week or try fasting for a day, full fasting for a day, or normal fasting, eating once or twice a day for a week or a month. And you'll discover such a lack of patience in you, and you'll discover such anger just raging in you, that you'll be completely taken by surprise. But that is the reality of who you are. That is the reality of your spiritual state. By avoiding these laboratory spiritual experiments that the Church is teaching us and encouraging us to go through, we simply go through life having no idea of the passions that we have inside ourselves. It's like going through life having these cancers inside, and we never want to go to a doctor, we never want to have them scanned, because we don't want to face the truth. Or as the fathers used to describe this, it's like going through life having snakes within your heart and you're never willing to face them. And as you keep on ignoring them, those snakes grow larger and larger, stronger and stronger, to the point when they become beyond control. Everything that the Church has taught us to do from the first centuries up to today is there for a reason and is there for our salvation. Whether or not we understand it, it is a spiritually useful thing to do. And the more we do them, the more we practice them, the more we grow in our own spiritual discernment and the more logical spiritually logical, they become to us as well. Discernment comes from experience. Experience comes from practice. And practice comes from that initial moment when you decide to be obedient to your spiritual father and the church through him. The more you learn about yourself, the more you learn how necessary it is to keep one's head down in humility and to judge no one and to condemn no one because our own sin is so great 
that to be able to judge someone else is beyond comprehension. It doesn't even cross your mind anymore. Keep your heads down. Keep your hearts up in hope and trust that Christ will save us regardless and despite our unworthiness and just move forward. Put everything on his shoulders and he in his grace and he in his mad love for mankind will save us. Practically speaking, all I can encourage you to do is to obey to the church and go through these, again, spiritual experiments, these lab-like experiments, because all these things will expose the snakes within your heart. And once you see them there, that will just force you to keep your head down because you will become naturally humble. It will no longer be a question of you choosing to be humble or not. You will be humbled by your own passions. Seeing these passions, seeing these snakes will make you humble by nature. And once you are humble, your head will be down and you will judge no one accept yourself and your hearts will be high to Christ because you learn that your salvation doesn't come from what you do or from who you are. Your salvation can only come from Him. And then your heart will pray for everyone. Your heart will mourn for everyone. Your heart will just be willing to offer itself in sacrifice for everyone because you will have learned by experience and by gaining discernment that everyone is one and that everyone is alike and that we all are fighting these passions the way the way this storm of ours is affecting everyone on this island not just me or our community I do hope this video made in the dead of night in a storm, with my brain paralyzed after a migraine, is helping someone out there. And I pray to God that the love I feel is somehow communicated to you and is somehow helping you move forward through a difficult moment in your life. I pray for you, whoever you are, wherever you are, pray for me and pray for the monastery and may we all be blessed through the prayers of the Mother of God and the Saints and through the grace of God. Amen, dear ones. Amen.